Hello, this is Kim Heal. Hey, Kim, how you doing? Good. Good, good, good. We're, Where's 530, anyway? Well, it's uh, Chico, California. Oh, good God, I played in Chico. I know, it's been a while since we've seen you here, actually. Oh, my God. Yeah, last time was probably about five years ago at the Brickworks you guys played with Lucero. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You were, yeah, there's about... 20 people there. I know. It was a good show. I was glad to yeah. be there. Uh, Are you but, there? Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, the Brickworks is no more, so. Oh. Yeah, I know. It goes that way, doesn't it? Yeah. I'm, I'm calling from Dayton, Ohio, so. Oh, okay. So where do people play, then, if they want to go play in Chico? Well, there's the Senator, but the Senator is one of those places that's, like, kind of too big for, like, really cool, hip indie bands. Yeah. But, but like... I don't know. It's we're kind of in a tough spot right now, but you know we still got the paper, so we're doing all right. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. But uh, what are you up to in in Dayton? I live here. I live with my mom and dad. My mom has the Alzheimer's. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'm over at that, uh, the uh, rehearsal house, and I'm um, practicing for the tour that's coming up. Actually, right. Yeah, we're trying to get the noises that we made from Raw off. Of, there's a song called Raw off of Last Splash and. We thought it would be cool to play that, but it was so hard because there's a Moog on it. Oh, okay. And Moogs, you know, they're hard to take on tour. They're hard to create the sound that you want. Yeah. You don't want to do, you, we don't do loops, so that, right. would, that, would be, that would be dorky for us anyway. So is your, is your sister out there too? You guys rehearsing together? Uh, yeah, exactly. And um, the red, do we have a redheaded playing the guitar now? We used to have a guy with a mustache, but now right. we have a redheaded girl playing, and she's here too. Oh, okay, cool. So it's, we're the three guitar players, so we're we're trying to figure out all the smart parts, and then we'll wait till the dumb rhythm section comes. Right. Um, what else is on your uh, breeder to do list before you guys set off? I keep, I keep. I'm having a case of these disappearing boost chant. I've got a 900 Marshall JCM, mm-hmm. and it's a head that goes back and forth from channel A to channel B with a foot switch. Mm-hmm. I'm, I really am having trouble um, keeping track of mine. I've lost like three, in the, and I've never lost one of these pedals. I mean, I've lost lots of stuff, but not this particular piece of gear. Yeah, yeah. This particular piece of gear, I'm having the hardest time, like... Like, a Kelly took mine yesterday, and I'm like, she won't give it back to me. She thinks it's hers. So right. I have to go out and buy another one. But uh, but I've already lost, like, two. That's a pain in the ass. It's a real pain in the ass. You know, doing gear is just like, I know there are bands out there. I don't know how they do it, but they make enough money to have equipment managers and shit like that. Uh-huh. I would... I would love to have an equipment manager. <laughs> I would just walk in and everything would be set up and, you know, tubed up, fused up, strings, you know. Right. Appropriately deadened, you know, but none of them absolutely dead, but none of them completely brand new either. Exactly, exactly. It'd be so awesome. That'd be the life. Yeah, it would. I, yeah. I noticed that this uh, coming tour is East Coast exclusive. Um, is there any chance you guys get out on the West Coast uh, in the not-too-distant future? Well, no, we did, the last time we did um, the fall, we did a fall run. We went from, uh, it was really fun, actually. We did, um, you know, Slims, of course, mm-hmm. and, and we did, you know, Seattle and and uh, a really pretty ballroom in Portland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but we didn't we didn't stop by Chico that time. Yeah, no, nah, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> San Francisco is good enough for me. I'm from the Bay Area, so I can make that trek. How far is that from Chico to San Fran? Uh, it's 160 miles, like two and a half hours, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a haul for me. That's like damn. <laughs> are uh, are there any places on the East Coast that you're particularly looking forward to hitting on this run? I haven't played Bowery in quite a while. Not not until like around the same time we played Chico. So that'll be nice. Right. And you guys have a couple stops there, right? Uh, we, yeah, we do two shows at Bowery, and it's all wooden. It's a really, have you been there before to see your show? I've not it's been really, to the Bowery room, no. It's actually a really nice acoustic room. It's gonna, it, things sound good in there. I saw Joanna Newsom there, like, oh, in yeah. 2005 or six or something like that, 2005. And, uh, you know, with her harp, and it was mic'd, it wasn't DI'd. Right. Uh, it was just, it was with the wood, it was just, it was just a really beautiful sound. It was really nice. That's cool. Yeah, she's from just right up the road in uh, Grass Valley originally, actually. So, yeah, she's a Northern California girl herself. Oh, really? It's just, you know, I talked to her after that show, and I really liked her right away because instead of talking about um, 
anything else, of course, we talk about what me and you just talked about, and mm-hmm. she, me, me and her talked about, um, you know, the size the size van that she needs to get the harp in, right? And like how many people it takes for to to, to pull the harp in, and right. the fact that she actually the di was broken on the harp, and and so now the sound men hate to like um, have to mic it because it's it's a challenging thing to do, but she said it sounds so much better that she's like. Thinking of like not fixing the DI, right? And just making people actually go through the trouble of having a mic on it. So it, it, I liked her right away because she talked about shit that I know about, which is mm-hmm. fucking fixing gear, which is all <laughs> I fucking do. <laughs> so, so you're something of a fix-it person yourself? No, hell no. I just have to deal with it. No, right. I'm, not, I'm not talented at it. But I tell you, it's really freaky. Mm-hmm. In Dayton, Ohio, there's a guy named oh God. His name is Chris something. Ivers, I think. Mm-hmm. He is the best tube guy I've ever met, and he just happens to live in this city. Oh, okay. He actually drives down to Nashville. He will actually go down there, and they'll send him stuff from their huge, huge studios down in Nashville. Right. And they'll send him stuff. He's a really good gear fixer. That's not a bad thing. One of the best. I know. It's incredible. Right on. And I can, if I have any questions, I can call Albini. And a bunch of the drones that work at his studio, I mm-hmm. call them drones because they all walk around with the gray overalls. Right. So they all look like worker bees. So I right. call so the drones, like that, but slash robot bees, the drones there, um, they're really good. And they're really nice, too. That's they're cool. Lo- yeah. So, and, they, and they explain things not in a... Not in a convoluted way that some people who don't know the material can explain things in. They know the material really good, so they say, you know the big button? Press it. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know that you guys hooked up with Albini again for one of the tracks off of uh, Fate to Fatal, and you guys must have a pretty good um, uh, working relationship from all the years, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Is this the kind of thing you ring him up out of the blue and, sure, come on in? Yeah, now he has a schedule, so um, a lot of times it'll, you know, it'll be, it'll be, you know, though it's on the wall. I mean, I know the office, and I see the calendars in my mind's eye up there. And if you know, it, luckily, we we live um, like five hours away from Chicago, so mm-hmm. me and Kelly can just throw the throw the gear into the car, and we can drive up there. You know, it takes, you know, a half a day to get up there. Right. So we'll usually leave and, and then drive up there, and then we'll work the next day. And so we need a day or two. And, he, you know, the really cool thing about Albini is when he built the studio, he built it to specs of what he needed. Mm-hmm. So one of the cool things about going to a studio is that you don't stand around with a snare drum in your hand, tapping it in all the different rooms, trying to find the sweet spot. Right. Because every single square inch of his studio is a sweet spot because he built it to be right. exactly that. Yeah. But, and he's got three separate rooms. So you've got, a, they call it, one is a Kentucky room, one is center field, and one of it is Alcatraz. Alcatraz is a small carpeted wood room that is absolutely air-sucking dry. Mm-hmm. And then there's a, the Kentucky room that has a, a slight delay. And then center field, which is a big, nice studio room. Right. So you can you can choose which, you know, what kind, and then boom, you're in, you know. Yeah, no, that's got to be nice. Yeah, it, it's really nice, and he's real easy to work with. He keeps his gear completely up to spec. Everything's going to sound good. You're, you know, it's just, yeah. and he's a nice guy. Right. And what I swear one of the good things about him is that, he, <laughs> I mean, this is going to sound awful, <laughs> but the, one of the good things about him is he doesn't care what you're doing. He's not into it. Right, I've heard that. And that's actually a positive thing. It's, it's. I mean, well, it depends on what kind of person. If you need somebody to hold your hand and right. tell, you, tell you you've just written the best song in the universe and that you're going to be big one day, right? then don't go to him. <laughs> if you want somebody, you know, if you made a stupid song and, and you think it's pretty cool and you feel pretty cool singing it and, and you know how to do it, then go to him because he'll record it the mm-hmm. best that is around. Right. You know, but he's not going to suggest, like, a tambourine on the chorus. Let me right. Mind. Actually, you know what? His girlfriend would. Okay. We've actually had her play some stuff on our stuff, because I've known her for so many years. They're getting married this fall. Oh, okay. Yeah. So he's yeah. just going to do the, he's going to, he's going to hardline it and leave the nitpicking to you, right, and just do his thing. 
Oh, yeah. That's cool. That's, a, that, yeah. that's definitely got its merits. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and, you know, there are some songs that I, that I don't take to him because I know they won't survive him. Right. <laughs> right. For some reason, they're flawed, and I, it's like I need a tambourine on this song. Right, right. I've done that once. I put a tambourine on the song once, and it was Fate to Fatal. Now, I've been digging on the EP, and although it's only four songs, um, I'd say it spans a little gamut of uh, songwriting styles and production process. Uh, would, you, yeah. would you say the same? Yeah, it does. You know, one was on a four track. One was at Albini Studio. Me and Kelly did it live. Mm -hmm. That was the chances are. Right. One is uh, analog up in a London studio. That's Fate to Fatal. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is all digital. The last time? Now, it, yeah, it wasn't gridded up, but it was all done all digital. You know, right. There's no, there's no loop on it. So right. You know, it's just used. Yeah. No. But yeah, that last time. Uh huh. So every single I, variation of recording. Did, uh, was that kind of the, I mean, when you just, did you kind of throw these songs together, or did you just, I mean, how, how'd, you, how'd you decide to make a little EP? Well, we had, um, we were writing last year, and then we went on this really long tour, and we had these sound checks in Australia, and we started pulling up Pinnacle Hollow and, and Fate to Fatal, and they sounded pretty good at sound checks, so we thought we would record both of those in London. Mm -hmm. We had a couple of days off in London, like, well, yeah, two days off in London, so... So we booked a studio, but we only got Fate to Fatal done because um, it took all day to record, and then some of the next day, and then that night to mix. Okay. So we could we didn't do uh, Pinnacle Hollow, so I ended up using the four track of the Pinnacle Hollow, um, and then uh, chances are that was just me and Kelly. So we you know we just did that acoustically. Right. And so we we went to we we thought we had known that I fell in love with that song in the '90s, and I just always have loved it. Mm hmm. Yeah, so we just we we we've tried to cover it before. We've done a demo in the basement with the full band, and we've done it in different ways on a on electric. But this time we tried it acoustically, and it sounded good. Yeah, I think it came out nicely. Yeah, I think it did too. It's kind of it, nice. Yeah. Instead of, yeah. And then the the last time one was uh, something I had in my head, and I. I asked a friend to come up and work the Pro Tools because I don't know how to work it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started, it was fun. It was fun to, it's just, it was really casual. It was fun to do. It's like, okay, well, if, if this one gets done, it can be the fourth one. Right. No, then I, well, I was talking to the guy who was doing the Pro Tools. We were, we, you know, we had brought up Mark Lanigan yeah. before because he was talking about, he really liked this. Um, solo album that Mark Lanigan did called mm -hmm. Bubblegum. Yeah, it's a and great I record. That guy, and I said, Mark Lanigan has a solo record called Bubblegum? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's odd. And, you know, it's weird because i just seen him play in the Gutter Twins because I, I have known Greg Dooley because he's from Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. And I'm from Dayton. So I've known him since, you know, the early 90s. And so it was funny. Uh, we, uh, we ended up, Breeders ended up doing a show in the same city, but we went to their show, Gutter Twins show, and when Lanigan opened his mouth, I had never seen a Screaming Trees show or anything. Mm -hmm. I was like, damn, that guy's got a weird, interesting, I know. good voice. I know, he's got it going on. Yeah, and it, so when this guy started talking about, the, he just started talking about it, and I said, you know, it's funny that I always thought that it would be really cool, maybe this could be sung by a guy. Mm -hmm. And I And I said to him, do you... Do you know anybody? And he because he had worked on some of the bubblegum stuff. This guy, right? He said, "I can, I can find him," and we did. And sure enough, he, Mark Lundigan said, "Yeah, I'm a fan. I'll do it." That's great. Yeah, no, I when I first turned it on, uh, I didn't know that uh, that you guys had grabbed him up, and I heard that voice. And I was just like, "Oh shit, they got Mark Lundigan yeah, right, right. with him." Yeah, because you just can't you can't miss it. And uh, I don't know if you've heard his latest release, uh, the the albums he's with been released. With with, yeah, with Sun, Sunday at Devil Dirt. And, no, and but I he, heard that that was good. It's really good, and he did Battle of the Broken Seas in the same uh, fashion before that. And, uh, and man, if 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 if, if you like the Gutter Twins or whatever, you know you'll love that stuff. Yeah. Um. So that, that's really cool. And yeah. um. And then I like the video a lot that you shot at the stadium in St. Oh, Louis. Yeah, isn't that cute? Yeah. Kelly did that. Kelly just drove out there, and then the bass player owns a camera. You know, he's from East LA, so. Mm -hmm. You know, they it, so they just filmed it themselves. It, she, that's a friend of ours that we've known since um, since she um, she left home to see the Lollapalooza concert. Okay. Um, without telling her mother, she was like sixteen or something. Mm-hmm. And and my mom met her back in '94 at the Lollapalooza concert, and, and 
my mom made sure that she had bus money and money for a hotel if it took because cause she didn't have any place to stay that night. It was really we've been friends with her every since. Right. And of course she's a roller derby girl. Yeah. So, so we run, we ran we run into her and Kelly just thought you know it'd be really cool I should call him Wyatt and see if I can get the I, just, I wonder you know, I just wonder if that could happen it'd be really, so cool to have. The girl skating around. And at the same time, there's this movie coming out called Whip It with Drew Barrymore, and they asked to use a couple of the breeder songs in the movie. Oh, okay. Like, Julia Lewis is going to be, like, the villain. Right. In the movie. And they're using... That's what I heard. Are they using new the some new breeder tracks? Cannonball and Bang On. Oh, okay, right on. Supposedly. But, you know, sometimes they, you know, sometimes you think it's going to happen, then you watch the movie and go, oh, they never end up using it because yeah. they ended up using something else, you know. Right. But that would be cool if they did because uh, I think it would be cool to see. Because I think Bang On specifically, the one that goes, you know, I love no one and no one loves me, mm-hmm. and that I think specifically is was supposed to be. Now, this isn't going to happen. Just because I'm saying it doesn't mean it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Because it might get changed, but supposedly um, there's a scene that she is supposed to, Juliet Lewis is supposed to do something shitty. Oh, okay. Or do something, which would be so fucking cool. That's her. Who, who, because it's Juliet Lewis acting. Yeah. A villain in oral, please. It's like, it would be so awesome. But, you know, I ran into her this past spring in mm-hmm. Spain with, uh, now she doesn't call them, it's not, it's not Julia Lewis and the Licks anymore. It, she's doing a, the new romance. Oh, okay. But actually, it's not even that anymore. She's calling it something different, but that was an old thing. But anyway, they were really good. Their sound was awesome. Right they, on. Like, they were using, like, a guy who, like, uh, started rat sound. Oh, okay. Yeah. What like, were you doing in Spain? Uh, we were breeders to the show this year. Oh, okay, cool. There. Yeah, it was a festival. Okay. Yeah. Now, in December, you're headed... Over to the UK for a ten year oh, yeah. celebration of uh, ATP. We're doing yeah, we're doing all tomorrow's parties again. We just got back from that in April. Okay, we right. Did, we curated it, and that was really fun. What is what time. what is the process of curating such a thing? Well, you, here's the deal: you can make it like when the first time we went over, uh, Shellac was curating, and that was in 2002, and that was at Camper Sand. Mm-hmm. So that was my first experience with it. I think that was probably the, maybe the third year they had it. Listen, I thought I was going to die, first of all, because I was so drunk. And because, <laughs> there, because I had a really bad cold. I was just a really hard, hard show. But I noticed that shellac was running at like some sort of um, communism camp, some socialist club or something. Uh-huh. They They book... All the bands themselves, they asked everybody themselves. They booked it. They negotiated the fees. Mm-hmm. They did the carne. They decided where everybody was. So the, at first, I thought, I thought, so Barry Hogan, who runs ATP, you know, he's mentioned before Breeders Curating in the past. And, of course, I said, oh, my God, no way. Mm-hmm. Are you kidding me? I don't have the brain power for that. It takes a... It's so above my pay grade, that kind of mental thinking to right. get everybody organized and to schedule everybody and to get everybody over. And then he explained, listen, that's the way Shellac did it. They, they, not everybody does it like that. You guys don't have to do anything, but just pick the bands you want. Right. And I was like, are you serious? That's not a bad gig. That isn't right. <laughs> I didn't have to do shit. All I had to do was pick the bands that I thought was yeah. what I'd want to see. And I was just one quarter of it. Then Kelly picked... Mondo picked and Jose picked. Right on. Yeah. We even let Cheryl pick one. Buffalo <laughs> Killers. Yeah. Yeah. So what is what is this next uh, next stop in December hold for you? That I'm not sure about. Now, that, of course, we're not curating. We've just been invited. But it sounds mm-hmm. to me like it's some sort of 10th anniversary of doing it. Yeah, yeah. That sounds so pretty cool. It started in 99, I guess. So, yeah. I know. It does sound cool. Now, how many times in your life do you think you've been asked if the Pixies are going to record again. You know, I was just talking to somebody about that today. I was talking to Heidi, the publicist, about that. Uh-huh. Because I don't, like, it's just, I don't know what it is about the Pixies that they get questions about when we're going to record again. I know, I know. It's like, <laughs> I mean, every interview that I read uh, that, that you guys do, it, it always gets asked. And I'm not going to ask because I already know the answer. But I, but I... <laughs> 
It's interesting that we get asked a lot, though, isn't it? Yeah, it is interesting. It's like, uh, I mean, it's cool. It's kind of a compliment. I think so, too. Yeah. But it is strange that I don't think, I mean, I don't think it happens to every band, you know? No, certainly not. No, I mean, I mean, you guys have kind of, I mean, the Pixies have become more than icons over the years, and for whatever reason, it just seems like, uh, you know, every, it's it's one of those, like, records that everyone imagines what it would sound like if it were to come out again, but... What do you think it would sound like? I don't know. It's, I mean, the fact that you and Frank both put out relevant music still leads me to believe, and, you know, Joey is busy with the rentals and stuff like that, leads me to believe that, um, you know, it would probably be good, um, yeah. but, I mean... Shit, it's been a long time, so who yeah. knows? It's funny, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. But, I mean, you guys put out that box set. That must have been kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, it was really cool. And it was cool to be able to go over there because Von Oliver hung up all the new stuff at the um, Underground, I think it was called, and we played a set there. It was really cool to see it. It mm-hmm. was really nice. And, you know, it kind of reminded me, Breeders played something called 13-Year Itch, mm-hmm. and it was something that 4AD had put on at their 13th anniversary, which is actually in 93. It was really, it was really cool. And he had all his artwork hanging up then, too. It was really cool. And I've been to an exhibition that Von Oliver had done, mm-hmm. uh, had done on, uh, in Rennes, I think, France, I think. Mm-hmm. It was, um, that, so... That was cool. It was kind of doing the Minotaur thing with the. It was kind of a slash gallery slash small show. Okay. So it was cool. Right on. I, I had a good time doing that and a good time seeing how old everybody's gotten. Now, now that the breeders are, I mean, you guys are kind of back in regular rotation now. You know, it's like you put out an album, you toured, you got an EP, yeah. you're touring yeah. again. Or do you yeah. think that you'll kind of continue the trend of just putting stuff out now? Yeah, I, I don't see why not, especially since it's. Um, it kind of bow. It, it, it's kind of in a weird way. It's free, you know the fact of, of just like music being free. It does free up a lot of like of you know. I'm just this person who has a huge expectation for records, and maybe I made it too big of a deal, you know. Mm-hmm. So it, it's nice, you know. It's like okay, well, it's not. The pressure is off because music's free. Nobody buys albums. It's just right. People, you know. Is it nice being, uh, you know, independent? You guys are putting out your own music? Well, yeah. You know, we've always done... um, Mountain Battles was a one-off with with 4AD, so Mm -hmm. that didn't seem... You know, it's nice, yeah. 4AD is a nice label, though. They're not... It's not like Interscope is like... I'm in arguments with them about my, my lack of... I don't know, whatever people like that get in arguments about. I don't know what they yell about. Yeah, yeah. What I don't know. Bureaucratic, what have you. I, have, I, have, I can't even imagine. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I, all I do is fix gear. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you know, Kim, thanks a lot for taking time uh, talking oh, to me today. It was really nice talking to you. Yeah, and I'm excited. Uh, I mean, hopefully you guys come back to the West Coast. You know, maybe, yeah. who knows? Maybe yeah. we'll see you in Chico sometime. Oh, but, uh, God. Yeah, at the very least, I'll get out to one of your gigs next time you're around. And, Good. Uh, thanks That'd again. Nice. Okay, nice talking to you. All right, bye. Bye.